<laughs> I got in touch because of the newsletters, exactly, because you were, you were trying to provide some advice, some some reading also to the people who are interested in in working with their voice and uh, by extension, I guess, also with their mind and their body and all the other things that are so related. So I thought it might be interesting to talk about this, especially, I think, um, in the current context of lockdown, where a lot of interpreters who are professional voice users find themselves you know sitting at home maybe doing a little bit of work from home but we can certainly we cannot do our usual lifestyle i guess we, we can't do our usual work the way we're used to doing it and i suppose you're in a different uh, or in a similar situation rather but we should probably start by by telling people a little bit who you are <laughs> um first of all because um the reason I, i reached out to you back in the day was uh, that i found out that you do dialect coaching and also some some voice coaching and it's it was just the realization i think that interpreters are professional voice users but probably don't think about their voice too much maybe they maybe they do it more but i, I had the impression that we don't think about our voice all that much maybe we don't take it seriously enough um and you had this great tweet i think um for professional voice users don't be a ski jumper do you remember that um where you were encouraging people <laughs> not to not to hunch over oh, like not this to come you know forward. yeah exactly yeah, not to lean forward like this and yeah. this is basically how we at least how we used to spend our days is sitting in a booth you know maybe not the best air quality as well which doesn't help hunched over a desk you know speaking into a microphone right in front of us and i thought yeah exactly you, we don't want to be ski jumpers so that that was where this initial um interest came from but lots of talk here from me let's hear a little bit um, um from you first what what is it that you do on a daily basis rebecca i suppose i work with the voice in all sorts of contexts i work quite a bit with actors on the their dialects their accents um also with multilingual actors to sound um not only clear in english but also competent to act in english and then on the flip side i work with any person really corporate types but it, it, they come from all different backgrounds people who want to feel more confident with their voice in a variety of situations i've worked with tour guides dealing with some very intense traffic noise and losing their voices lawyers who need confidence in front of a, a, a courtroom mm. worked with um oh gosh university lectures confidence in front of students and um so i suppose yeah it's 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 i work with the voice whether that's accent whether that's breathing and the voice what we don't realize is the voice is just in our bodies so it's the muscles of our bodies the breathing um the 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 actual air support all of that goes into making the voice yeah there's so much to unpack uh, in there right i think that's the interesting thing um so when you work with sort of different clients from different backgrounds different contexts what what what's your impression what is the awareness of how important voice is and how connected it is to you know it's not just the voice right here it's connected to your entire body and if something occupies your mind and maybe you're stressed and tense that makes it difficult to use your voice correctly i think um how how aware of people of that or is it, it did you always get the sort of aha moment where people think oh yeah voice is so much more than just what comes out of my my mouth i guess i think what i see often in sessions is that people come and they they have a sense that there's a problem somewhere of they're losing their voice quite a bit or when they get into stressful situations they they they, they always um uh their voice goes up or they can't think of thoughts or their brain seems to be in front of their thoughts um they always have a dry throat or a or a, a locked jaw or feeling like there's something tense in the back of the throat and it's not as so normally we start to do the exercises which are not very invasive really i'm i'm not normally asking a lot of personal questions but sometimes there is that aha moment of ah oh, i get like this because of the situation and the stress or the anxiety that i'm being put into that my body's reacting to that mm. so do you find yourself often 
maybe starting with these exercises, not not really working with the voice uh, at all in the beginning, maybe just having to deal with other issues, so to speak, uh, before you can get to the actual voice work, be it, you know, uh, accent removal, we can get into that, um, or projection or stuff like that. I try to get a real sense of the person to start, and sometimes they already know what's going wrong. Um, but if not, then we're taught as voice coaches to really listen and observe both with our ears and our eyes. So you're looking for any tensions being held in the body. Maybe that's a tension in the chest. Of course, I'm kind of slumped here, but tensions in the chest, in the shoulders, maybe irregularities in the breathing pattern. Um, is the voice really croaky? Um, or is the voice really, really tight? Yeah. Um, and is the jaw really tight? We're taught to look at all of these characteristics. And then we have ways in exercises to work with those characteristics. But to answer your question, I mean, certainly the psychological aspect comes up in sessions. Yeah. Ultimately, I'm not a therapist, so just if, gonna if ask, it is, yeah, <laughs> yeah if, it, if it is something um, that seems quite serious or the client wants to explore further, then I certainly recommend therapy. But the aha moment might come because the client said, I keep losing my voice. We work together a bit. And then once the client is now in touch with that part of their body, and they can say, oh, I'm losing my voice because of this situation. Right. And um, by the way, for, for those of you who are joining us, feel free to pop a question into the Q&A or into the chat. Well, I'm happy to pass that on to um, Rebecca. So no worries about that. You just mentioned that when you when you basically when you were taught, um, people are often surprised that interpreters can actually study to become interpreters. Uh, that that's just something you can do in a college or university. Um, so I suppose you get the same reaction sometimes. Is that, oh, voice coaching. Okay, that's that's a, a real profession, I guess, or something. Well, that sometimes, you all the time, <laughs> all the time, people go, what? I didn't know that was a job. Uh, yes, all the time, certainly. And uh, I, I guess it's, we're in a way, we're, we're kind of, we're we're maybe a little bit out of the 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 singing coaching tradition. Traditionally, someone would learn as kind of uh, to be a voice coach as kind of an apprentice um, and and learn as alongside a, a more senior teacher. And now, yeah, there's pro programs and, and entire curriculum <laughs> to make a voice coach. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't I don't know how how if you can say is it is it quite similar to a singing coach because I had I had singing lessons way back when when I was in school and um, just looking at some of the activities that you did on your YouTube channel for example I thought there were quite a few similarities to yeah I guess what a singing coach does in terms of warming up and that, that was one of the questions we got um, for warm-up exercises which are also not just for the voice but basically for the entire body to you know just loosen up and um, and get ready for what you, what you want to do Certainly, there's some overlap between singing and speaking. Singers are, are vocal athletes. They have to, to uh, kind of bring their voice to great heights. E even, if, you know, even if you're not a Whitney Houston, you're still, <laughs> even just the act of singing is, is quite athletic, takes quite a bit of breath control, um, pitch and uh, resonance uh, matching or, or manipulation. So, um, yeah, there is certainly a lot of, of overlap between those two things. I'd say that the, the main thing with, with both, but definitely with voice coaching, straight speaking coaching, is we're always starting with the body and the breathing. That's, that's the, the, the foundations of voice. And the, 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 your breathing mechanism is just your muscles, right? Your, your, your lungs, your diaphragm, your lower abdominal muscles, the, your ribs, but you have muscles in between the ribs, intercostal muscles. Um, so we're looking at releasing any tensions, tensions that kind of are covering up a free and embodied natural voice, tensions that we put on maybe through 
trauma, through stress, through anxiety. And as we release those tensions, the breathing becomes more free um, and it becomes stronger as well as a result. And then we bridge that breathing onto voice so that you can actually sustain phrases. And then from sustaining the phrases, we bring that onto resonance so that the voice is, is full, not overly nasal, um, not overly, not, not, on, not overly high pitched if, if someone doesn't want a high pitched voice. Um, and then finally, of course, then there's the shaping of the sounds of, of the voice. So we're, we're working with all of those layers. Yeah, and I, I guess there is lots to lots to work with, and also lots to unpack there. With, that's something that the questions are sort of pointing to as well. So maybe let's um, let's stay with uh, with a breathing uh, a little bit for now. I, I, we don't want to turn this into a, a breathing session, but um, I guess we could we could share some resources probably and point point people to your uh, exercises that you have on YouTube, for example, mm. on how to sort of uh, yeah how to do breathing exercises and warm up exercises um, for the for the voice, but. I wanted to get to something else first, because before we started, you said that you do some sessions over video conference at the moment, because there's, there's just no other option. So you keep working with your clients. Do you find, you know, without oversharing, do you find that people are affected by what's happening? Do you, do you find that they're more anxious, maybe more, more tense uh, in a way? I think certainly people are bringing more outside baggage into the sessions mm. currently. Yeah, definitely. And I think one thing that doesn't help with Zoom is that it's very two-dimensional. So not only are people coming in stressed, but it's hard to kind of gauge how loud you need to be. It's hard to kind of gauge, um, you know, distancing. It's hard to kind of gauge filling up the, the space in the room. Mm. And so people's voices are tiring quicker over Zoom. Um, and people are, are coming into more of a squeeze in the throat. And of course, we're sitting in chairs all day. And even in this chair, I'm, I have terrible posture right now. We're we just not, you know, we're not, it, it, it's just not allowing us to kind of let off the anxiety and the steam that we have to come into the Zoom call. And then on top of it, on the Zoom call, voices are getting tired because we're not posture is not great um and the, the, the just the sense of connection between humans where you can kind of gauge how loud you need to be or or uh, you know how much you need to actually support your voice isn't happening yeah. we're not being fully embodied we're we're, we're in kind disembodied, of disembodied literally little, yeah yeah just yeah. in a in a little like screen like so yeah so the zoom fatigue i mean there's a lot of writing at the moment about it i think it's definitely real and there are a lot of different aspects to it and um yeah i think that also the problem that we spend so much time kind of in our in our home or maybe even the same room doing one zoom session after the other sometimes or at least it feels that way that certainly doesn't help whereas when you have I guess when you have normal workshops and people come to the space that you use for that, or just the the change of space kind of probably launches something in the head, just a different state of mind. So people are maybe more open to to doing that. Whereas now, you know, they're just in their I don't know kitchen or bedroom or whatever it may be, and and having to do that, I think that makes it more difficult. Um, yeah, more difficult as well. So. What would be your recommendations for for people who are just interested in, in getting started? I think with breathing exercises, is there is there? I suppose there's lots of material on YouTube as well. Uh, there's something for everything for everything there. Um, what what would be kind of? I think you had a top five at some point uh, mm -hmm. for breathing mm -hmm. exercises. I think people would be very interested in that. Certainly. Well, the place to start with breathing is release. First, first and foremost, um, and that would be the release of the muscles of breathing. So, oftentimes with clients, we're get, I'm getting them weird, like like I'm a multiple person. I'm getting them onto the floor very quickly, and I I think I showed in my my YouTube video my favorite exercise of all time is to roll up a towel and placing it on the length of the spine because you're going to not only open up your shoulders and chest but you're also allowing the muscles of the back to release onto the floor muscles of the sacrum the bum um, to release down and you just lie there and it the release takes time 
really. The release and the stretching, quite a bit of stretching. Um, it takes time. And it takes, um, funny enough, it takes a funny sort of concentration as well. You, Even though you're letting go, you really want to place your focus on the breathing as you do this. Um, it's amazing how many times a day we just hold our breath. Just completely unconsciously holding our breath out of, um, a, a, normally it's a sense of kind of not wanting to feel something. Yeah, just tension not building want, up for it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we just hold our breath. Whereas these breathing exercises, not only are they releasing all of the muscles, but you're getting in co contact with the breathing so that you start to notice it in this exercise. And what happens is as you bridge out of the exercise, you're going to start to notice it throughout the day. You're going to start to catch yourself when you are holding your breath um, and noticing that and going, okay, breathe, breathe. Yeah, I don't know if people noticed that. That was I saw that on on Twitter quite often recently is just a, a just tweet from random people saying unclench your jaw. And it says, oh, yeah, right, right. I'm, I'm sitting here. And it's it's not just because of Twitter, because it can be stressful sometimes, but just <laughs> life in general and people telling you, oh, right, yeah, I'm, I'm a little tense. And the whole noticing point, I think, is really important. And also what you mentioned, that, that time. So I think it's it's very, uh, very difficult also to see, OK, I, I cannot just take two minutes right now out of my super busy day and do some breathing exercises because they just take time to get into the you know, right state of mind and stuff like that. I remember when I when I was a kid, I used to go to karate lessons. And one of the first things we did was just not even meditation, but just sitting there in silence and breathing and just arriving, basically. And mm -hmm. that always took longer than we thought. But it, it was very useful because it helped you to sort of focus on, on what you were about to do. And I think the same is also true for, you know, interpreting in our case, just arriving on time, ideally not being rushed and just arriving in the room and, and just being there for a few minutes and calming down, you know, before the mm -hmm. onslaught mm -hmm. starts. So I think that's, yeah. I imagine that's difficult because you work with film actors a lot. I imagine that's sometimes difficult to do if you're with them on set, which I think you sometimes do. And there's probably so much, you know, buzz around. It's, it might be difficult to get them to focus on the things that you're trying to coach them, I guess, or, or give them notes or things like that. I, I always try to be sure that we have a dedicated time for for voice work or dialect work because you know they have a dedicated time for hair and makeup they have a dedicated time for do, yeah. for uh, for costume they have a dedicated time for for breakfast lunch and dinner they have a dedicated time for everything so I make it a point that they need to have written to their schedule a dedicated time for voice and dialect for a warm up and. That's crossing over for my interpreters or my conference, um, conference interpreters rather, and, and also my corporate people, people who aren't actors. What people in the real world normally forget is actors, <laughs> actors rehearse, actors warm up. You're doing yourself a disservice on that big presentation, not giving yourself that 10 minutes to warm up. Um, and then it's about how do you ground yourself in the moment with the this, this stressful situation? As you said, yes, maybe you don't have time to go, hold on, let me take 15 minutes and do a breathing exercise. Yeah, exactly. But what you can do, one, oh, here's a great one taught to me by, um, by a voice coach um, called Barbara Hausman in London, is the idea of, um, and I think this is taken from, Buddhist, I don't quote me on this, but it's the idea of the backward circle. Yes, I've heard of so this. Yes. You can have, even if you have like a pen, I don't have a pen sitting there, but you have a pen and you just slowly roll it backwards towards you. Yeah, like so. exactly. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, or if you have a ring, even you can just slowly kind of bring the ring backwards towards you. And it's a real sense of check in with yourself and then send your energy back out to the other person. So breathe and then connect, <laughs> right? Yeah, so that works. Constantly regrounding yourself and resending your energy back out.
this backward circle idea. I, re- I really love the backward circle. I use it still. That was taught to me years ago. So yeah. Um, and it's surprising that these simple techniques often work so incredibly well once you, you know, let them do their job basically and don't think oh, it's just, you know, esoteric stuff. But <laughs> very often it does it does work really well. So yeah, give that a try. Exactly. Um, I, I, we had a comment here from Marcus who said that uh, in interpreting studies, um, you know, voice or voice coaching very often isn't really a thing. We have some voice coaching where I work very occasionally only, but uh, it's true that it's not really part of um, not really part of interpreting studies. What I did in university is what was I sang in the choir, and then there we had some sort of singing lessons and voice warm ups and all that stuff, and that helped me an awful lot. Um, to, yeah, I guess just be more connected to my voice. I don't know if that's sort of part of what you call the embodied uh, voice, Rebecca. Um, if not, maybe maybe mm-hmm. take us a little bit just into that subject or that that concept, I guess, and and what that means. The embodied voice is is it about yeah being more connected with your voice, um, being in control, I guess, or uh, using it properly. This is that's a great question. I embodied embodied i mean i throw that word around so much to me it just feels i suppose it's like after you get done with a really great yoga class or or you use meditation or it's about feeling at home in your body but also feeling like your voice is at home in your body um it's it's settled it's it's being produced by all of the muscles of your body, your breath of your body, and it's fully realized. It's a holistic picture, as opposed to oftentimes we think the voice is here at our throat. But finding the sense of the power of the voice comes actually from underneath, right? Your diaphragm, Within. your yes, ribs, exactly. deep abdominal muscles, all of that um, is working, comes up, you know, your, your trachea, through your your uh, larynx, vibrating your vocal folds, and then being shaped by your mouth, that it's really a full body picture, not just a point at the neck. That's my voice picture. Yeah, well, it's like an instrument, right? And the instrument is also not just mm. where, the, where the sound comes out, but there's much more sort of behind it producing all that sound. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and another concept that I um, learned from you, but also s- saw from a, a, f- a friend I had once, um, was the whole concept of breath work. What, what does that entail? Is that about sort of techniques you can use, breathing techniques, or is, is, that, is there some spirituality to that as well? Uh, because it, it sounds like it's very mm-hmm. intense, I guess, that the word work there, I think, implies that, so I'm not sure. Well, breath work, uh, as it's currently being used, normally refers to something like um, holotropic breath work or um, transformational breathing. It's not so much for voice work. Now, I've done breath work before, um, and it is quite intense. You're essentially kind of putting yourself in a hyperventilate hyperventilating state it's not um considered dangerous but um you it sounds isolated. a bit like it's dangerous she says, yeah. i've done it i've done it multiple times and i haven't died yet yeah um, <laughs> thank god but you will go into a a trip like state and it may, uh, you know, illuminate parts of your unconsciousness just as a, a, as a trip on some sort of uh, drug might do um, that, that uh, you weren't aware of in the past. So I often recommend breath work. I, I don't do breath work personally. I'm not a trained breath work person. Um, I do it as, as, and I see someone who facilitates it with me, but I don't, I'm not a facilitator. So I've recommended breath work before to clients, but it's really more, I would say, a a therapeutic and kind of exploratory uh, system of working versus that it's automatically going to impact on the voice. But if someone has a lot of um, of, um, breathing issues or breathing holds that seem very psychological, breath work can be wonderful. Hmm. 
Yeah, we had a comment here from Alison. Uh, she was asking whether it's like circular breathing with an instrument, which is something that I've heard of in the in the context of a didgeridoo. I think is that apparently it's a very sophisticated breathing technique where you kind of breathe in and out at the same. Well, I don't know if it's po not. It's, I don't think it's possible at the same time, but it's sort of a, a fluid circular breathing. So I, I don't know if you can if you can speak to that. But I kind of like the idea. And and certainly, I suppose playing an instrument, especially a wind instrument, would, would certainly help with having very good breathing technique, I suppose. I, I don't know if you play any instruments. So if, if you can, I do, yeah. I play, I mostly play piano. Um, I did play flute um, as a child, yeah. um, like a real flute. You know, yeah. I've uh -huh. I played the flute and like a proper but, flute, not a recorder. A yeah. I played a proper flute um, from the age of about Mm, 11 till 15 and then I was then I went <laughs> you know but I've, I've continued to play piano yeah. instruments yeah lovely way to work uh, breath as well but the key is is figuring out how can you switch over from the breath work that you've attained through the the instrument into your speaking I've had people who have amazing capacity breath capacity that I've worked with but just don't quite know how to use that capacity yet oh. in their speaking voice. And once That's that unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> connection is made, they are there. You know, they already have all of that expansiveness, um, but the connection needs to be made first. Too. Yeah. But I think once you have that, when it clicks, that must be, yeah, that must be amazing, I think. And uh, Alison followed up and, and said, yeah, it helps to last longer with a sentence. So I suppose it's just, it, it's about, you know, stamina and, and being made. Um, I think you called it just sustaining, sustaining uh, voice or, or voice use, I guess. So that's, I think, where, where breathing uh, comes in handy uh, as well. Absolutely. Um, I noticed in one of your n newsletters that you said that my actors, again, I, I love how you say that my actors may be surprised uh, to learn that a voice, a coach can get a sense of their mental state just through tuning in with the actor's um, breath quality. I think that's what you said earlier, right? That they, you know, obviously people bring along baggage and, and just from mm. how they breathe, well or maybe not so well you know maybe that tense you can already tell a lot about the the person you're working with i guess certainly certainly i i've, I've been in classrooms drama school classrooms before where you just think okay that person's a control freak that person is not confident that person is trying to pretend like they're confident and it's all through the breathing. Yeah. Yeah. You can really, once, once, once you're, you're taught to recognize it, you can really get a sense of the other people. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find the same to be true for how people speak that voice quality is that you can, you think you can tell a lot about a person by the way they're speaking, like, you know, is, is it like nasally or very, very uptight, or maybe I, I find myself often projecting downwards without really noticing it, uh, especially on Zoom, by the way, um, and then just listening back and saying, careful with your voice. But, but I suppose you, as a professional, you can read a lot from that, can't you? The voice is just a part of the body. So whatever tensions that are coming, they're, they are illuminating certain things that are that are popping up there are, there are obviously the extreme examples there's the example of maybe a, a female who sounds quite um a little girlish and maybe is is unconsciously resisting becoming kind of a woman um you've got the extreme examples of of people completely falling off their voice not committing to what they're saying but you also have the less extreme examples, just the little hold in the back of the tongue that might have been, you know, uh, someone who didn't want to cry and is holding their jaw tension. Oftentimes that's very smart. I've noticed it's very smart people, um, often <laughs> usually intelligent people. And it's like the last form of control out of their mouth that they can control the words before they leave the mouth. Very unconscious. Again, where none of us are doing this by making the choice that we're doing. It's just the habit that we have because of the, the what has gone on in our brain. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a, a, a great a great point. I guess it's it's almost a little bit like a handshake. You know, you can you can tell a lot from a handshake whether it's one of these sort of soft, <laughs> awful handshakes. I, mm. I mean, um, you know, back in the day when we still used to do, used to do handshakes, I guess. Yeah, um, that was a good a good comment here. Did, did you did, have you ever worked with interpreters um, in terms of voice coaching or uh, not yet? I have worked with interpreters. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and it's it's mostly about if they're if they're conference interpreters, it's it's about dealing with how to deal with the microphone, really. <laughs> oh, like mic technique and stuff like that. Well, I don't quite teach mic technique, but or it's about projecting. how not. Yeah, how Sorry. not yeah. to you know lose your voice uh -huh. with the mic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and a lot of that is posture. Yeah, finding good breathing even when you are sitting and speaking to a mic as opposed to a real person. Yeah. So it's the, the ski jumper problem, I think, and or maybe slouching and you know, just like sitting like this um, because we spend well, so much we... time sitting no, down. Go so, ahead. Yeah, no. Well, I was saying as we slouch, we just lose connection to all of those deeper muscles of breathing. So we're then you're going into taking top up breaths, really. Um, and a lot of times then um, if we're, we're kind of, pressing with the muscles in and around the larynx to create any type of power because we just have lost control of anything below the level of the larynx. Yeah. And, and I suppose similar things happen in, in video calls. I think you, you mentioned that earlier is that, that um, it's just very difficult for people to, um, to use to use the proper level of voice, I guess, maybe maybe in terms of volume or loudness, you're projecting right. Uh, I have people in my household uh, who you can hear throughout the house when they're on the video call. And I say, that's not necessary. The microphone is, is good enough. You don't have to be quite that loud. Um, so <laughs> is that something, that's something that you work on as well, I suppose, is, is how to, you know, work with the mic and not, I don't know, not against the mic or not trying to scream through the, through the glass pane that separates us from the delegates. Exactly, exactly. And currently, since everything is on Zoom, my sessions and also people's work is on Zoom, people and clients are seeing the changes quicker in a way because they're immediately having to use the techniques that we used over Zoom over Zoom. <laughs> so it's kind of an exact an exact match mm. as opposed to um Normally, of course, you know, be in my small space working and then they'd have to go out and maybe give a presentation or actually be in the um, interpreting booth or, or whatnot. And, and it might be a feel slightly different, but now it's it's exactly the same. And I also the positives of Zoom, if I can give Zoom some positives, is that we can record and and so clients can listen back in real time and hear the changes and, and sense those changes and can work from the recording as well. Yeah, just to, to go back to, to exercises, I suppose. Yeah, that's very useful indeed. Um, I was going to ask another thing. Oh, that's right. Um, did, did you get requests from, from some of the interpreters you work with also about, um, Nikki called it accent enhancement techniques. I don't know if she was referring to the same thing or accent um, removal or uh, that, that kind of thing, because you said you sometimes work in, in sort of a multilingual context as well. So sort of, I guess mm. reducing non-native speaker accent or markers. Um, is that what you had with interpreters as well? Or was it mostly about voice? And, and it, it, it wasn't so much with interpreters, but I've done a lot, a lot of work with multilingual, both actors and non-actors on sounding clear and confident in English. I hate the term accent reduction. I know. That's why I was so don't hesitant to use it. Yes. <laughs> well, we, we, we don't want to, as like voice coaches, we don't want to reduce any part of, of you and, 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 and where you so, come from. Yeah. Instead, we want to be sure that you are not only competent in English, but clear in English. And a lot of times that's just understanding that English has some sounds um, that are different from every other language, annoyingly. Um, uh, common probably culprits. Point out, sorry, that you, so you're based in London, so you'll have a lot of international clients, I suppose, who are trying to just fit in or just, just advance mm -hmm. in the local mm -hmm. labor market, right? 
Yeah, 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 certainly. Certainly they feel like maybe that there's there's some sort of um, uh, stigma against them because they're, they, they don't speak British English. Now, of course, I'm American, so I'm not normally working towards British English. I can if people request it, but I, I'm... I'm more interested with my non-actors that that the the client ultimately is yeah clear and confident. Those are my 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 two go-to words. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because, as you said, accent has so many negative connotations, or you used to have it. I I get the impression it's changing a little bit at least, but it's a big topic for interpreters as well, especially if you work into a language that is not your native language. That's what Nikki said. There is losing your native accent in the foreign language. Um, sometimes it's just very difficult to do, um, and and I'm not sure if it's always the desired outcome necessarily. I mean, as you said, if it's clear and sorry, what was the other word you so clear and confident? Com confidence yeah. using the language, yeah. Exactly. I think if you can if you can get to that stage, I think that's already very good. And and maybe it's not even necessary to get rid of your native accent, like a hundred percent, if that's even possible. And then even. You know, as you just said, so there's American English and British English, and of course, a lot of different, let's say, phonetic varieties in those two big groups. I mean, there's so many mm -hmm. different American accents, so many different English uh, accents in on the British Isles. So I, I, f I find that the whole concept of accent increasingly difficult to handle. And I know we did a whole episode about that, so we don't have to revisit um, all of that. <laughs> But let's say you have somebody who's really determined to to lose their accent is that is that something you would try to talk them out of or maybe just say okay we can maybe do some of that but you don't need to do you don't need to get rid of everything and maybe it's not even possible i don't know i try to be very honest up front and now currently with uh zoom i'm i'm asking people to record themselves often if they if they are coming with i need to completely get rid of my accent i'm asking them to record themselves in advance um there are some actors that have very good ears even if they're in a second language i worked with a, a, a swedish actress yesterday amazing ear nearly american there um and and it was like a few little tweaks And, and she sounded great. And then I worked with uh, another actor today who's um, two, two, uh, a couple different actors today who are, who are working in di from different languages. And, um, you know, we're of the mind of that this is going to be a competence and clarity situation. And, and they're aware of that. Yeah. You can lose an accent, certainly. It'll take, it just takes different lengths of time for different people <laughs> yeah and i guess it, it, it's something that gets difficult the, the older you are is that similar to language learning it's just more difficult to because i think that's that's to some extent that is really related to hearing at some point you, you just don't pick up the fine nuances uh anymore i'm not sure if i'm rendering the research properly but it, it may be something that is just very difficult at a certain point just like learning a foreign language well we, we do start to shut off um, the, just the ability to hear certain sounds, even from age two or so, we're, we're so focused on the language that we're being taught that that um, certain sounds we just can't hear them. I'm dying to do this thing in Paris called uh, Tomati. Have you ever heard of Tomati? Yes, I have. Yeah, that's on my topic list actually. But yeah, we can go into that right now um, because I know an interpreter who does courses, I think, or who works with the Tomati technique in Cologne. But yeah, maybe you can tell people briefly what, what it's about or who, who Tomati was. Well, yeah, so, well, of course, I would say Tomatis, but Tomati um, yeah. is, uh, <laughs> I, I suppose he was a, a, a kind of a, a he, a, an ear researcher and scientist and And was fascinated by by how the ear can perceive certain sounds, and so the Tomati out of Paris right now. It's at a place called uh, Fréquence Long, Fréquence Long. Um, so I'm giving them a big plug right now that I suppose they they need or don't need um, Fréquence Long, and it's essentially ear training of a language. And so the the idea is that you're you're inner ear 
is actually kind of shaped or gets shaped by the sounds that you hear when you're very young. And, and so you hear those sounds much easier, but you know, there's, there's, um, there's certain sounds in other languages that maybe your language doesn't have it. And they're very hard to hear. I think there's this one vowel in Estonian that is like, I can't even do it. Uh, 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 uh. I sound like I'm choking on myself. I've tried to get this vowel in Estonian and I, it will never happen for me. But I, my ear cannot really hear it. If you cannot hear a sound, you cannot reproduce that sound. So the Tomati system is about retraining your ear to pick up these new frequencies. It's amazing. I would love to do it. Yeah. Do you know how that works in practice? Do, do, they, do you do exercises or do, do they make you listen to certain sounds or... They make you listen to quite a bit of music at the frequency of the language that you're trying to go towards. Then they make you listen to speakers, but they're kind of, the speakers have been modulated. So it'll be speakers in your target language, but the speakers maybe have been modulated so you can start to pick up these frequencies. And then you're doing, at least at Fréquence Long, then you're also doing kind of standard language uh, classes with the teacher where, you know, you're speaking and listening and responding. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I wanted to um, pick up on one of the questions here from Alice, and uh, she asked whether we should shadow the voice style of the speaker as interpreters. Maybe we can just open up that question a little bit and, and ask you in, in your practice, how much is sort of when, when, when I think when, when clients are aiming at a particular accent, how much is, is there any sort of work you do in having them I guess just shadow that, just imitate that to sort of help them get there? Or is that not a good way of, of going about things in terms of getting to a particular accent? You know, just a silly example, if I wanted to speak like Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins, is it a good <laughs> idea to just, you know, watch the movie and then just uh, shadow him, I guess? Well, funny enough, I do quite a bit of um, mimicking work, but I, I call it conscious mimicking. Um, I love using uh, GarageBand, and and I'll take a speaker, a, a, like let's say a native speaker, and I'll I'll break them up into small little clips, and I'll actually have the the client who's with me consciously mimicking that person, um, and it it kind of acts as a as an ear training exercise, but also a little bit of like a a springboard to get the person in the accent. You'll feel as you do it, you know, your your mouth has to kind of change shape your um, kind of pronunciations have to change shape, your overall rhythm and stressing changes. And so you can start to sense the, the language and the accent and, and how the melodies flow, the intonation patterns. So I'm not against the, the conscious mimicking, but you do know that you know it, it, it's, it's just a springboard into the place that you want to go. Is it, is it similar with music? Do you have people like if they're, if they're into that uh, singing in the target language, I guess, or target accent, maybe. Because I, I found that music always helped me um, in language learning when it comes to, you know, getting good pronunciation and, and just, you know, especially in French, like when singing French makes it easier to sort of get the liaison and stuff like that, right? Is that something that you use as a tool at all? You know, you giving you play an instrument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's, many people find it easier to sing in a foreign language or to sing in a, in a different accent than they do to speak in it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Possibly that's because the vowel sounds in singing are, are longer. So, um, it, you know, you, you kind of have more time to get through the, the words. But I think singing is wonderful. And then, you know, you can go singing into, into, speaking you can start by singing and then you can speak or oftentimes with with speaking coaching especially for people on this call maybe are going oh i hate singing i don't want to sing but with singing shame. coaching we do a lot of intoning so that's just singing on one note yeah exactly so and I, then I, you can switch yeah absolutely yeah i think that's super helpful so i just shared the the link to your uh, vocal warm-up uh on youtube if people want to check that out after after the call or maybe tomorrow uh although you could do that any time of the day so i i guess uh, because we had different questions for breathing exercises and vo voice exercises but i think it's difficult to to take the two apart right i think it sort of flows into each other and because breath and voice are just so interrelated mm -hmm. so you, you can't just do one or the other i suppose is that correct 
Uh, I would say that's true, but I would say that we we kind of when we're looking at creating a warm up, we're first looking at body and breath. So if it's like if you can do nothing else before a presentation or before conference interpreting or before you know wherever you are, start with the body and the breath, and then extend that out onto a little bit of voice as well. Um, but but certainly they're they're completely interrelated you you can't have you can't have a free and open voice without a free open and supportive breath yeah that's a good point exactly um and i guess on on a related note uh, do you give do you give advice to clients in terms of diet as well because i know my singing teacher at least was very very particular in in sort of what she would allow us to to drink, for example, before. Uh, so this was about musical performances or what we were allowed to drink. It, it was always supposed to, uh, it was always, it had to be flat water, so no sparkling water and all that kind of stuff. Is, is that more like personal preference or is there some actual science or, or something from your experience that sort of tells you what, what people should drink to, for example, for, before a big presentation, you know, because for us it was, yeah, um, still water, definitely no milk because apparently milk is very bad because all the fat sort of sticks to your, I don't know, to your voice for some, I don't know. Uh, is there, is there any, any advice you can give us on that and proper diet and. Well, f fluids, fluids is, yeah, is number one. Um, people often think for some reason that, that the, 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 the fluid liquid that you take in actually touches the vocal folds. It doesn't. That is a that is a something that is is uh, is a, is a myth. But what it does is that it hydrates you the, the fluids hydrates you from the inside out. So it's actually going into your body and then hydrating all of the tissues of your body, including your vocal folds. So still water, you know, is like the go to any type of of herbal teas. Um, and not too, too, too hot. And no peppermint, yeah, right? Is that peppermint apparently is bad? Is that true, or is that a myth as well? Because somebody tell me peppermint's no good for voice. I don't know if that's true. Keep in mind that you're also we're also going to be dealing with every individual is a little bit different. You know, on the whole, I would say try to avoid caffeine. You know, an hour before. <laughs> no, you can solve your morning coffee, but you know, maybe, yeah, maybe know. an hour before, don't you know? Right. Don't kick back the the the, the caffeine. Um, but everyone's different. I, I, I say, you know, avoid, avoid foods that, that give you, um, indigestion or, or heartburn, but for people that's going to, you know, that's going to be different for different people. Um, sure. but yeah, yeah certainly, actually, what works. Cer certainly avoid the foods that give you indigestion and heartburn because <laughs> the acid does actually touch your vocal folds that way up coming up the wrong way. up, Yeah. You they will touch yeah, yeah yeah the the liquid going in your <laughs> your mouth does not touch your vocal folds directly but the the acid coming out does so that's <laughs> yeah. that's extremely important actually you know you do not want to kick off any type of, of heartburn or end indigestion no no right. definitely not yeah um I mean, we we talked about accent a little bit, but since Nikki was asking about accent enhancement te techniques, did, what would be a good good way to people just start uh, if they wanted to reduce their accent? I suppose this is in a yeah in a foreign language. Um, are there any easy? I don't know if they're easy. Any good tips to just start out uh, reducing that? Would you, would you say that mimicking is one option? I mean, for somebody who maybe isn't working with a, a professional like you yet. Mimicking certainly is a, is a good place to start because, as I said before, you can't reproduce the sounds you can't hear. So you want to start really immersing yourself in the language and the and the target accent right off the bat, and then getting it into your own voice is is important too. So not just kind of we have the passive listening, but also the active listening and the the kind of conscious mimicking with that. Oftentimes, I find with multilingual speakers and this varies this isn't this isn't everyone but in an attempt to sound kind of casual in the language they're barely opening their mouth <laughs> which is great for rp isn't it <laughs> it could be for RP. yeah could but not for other for. languages or uh, other varieties 
but well, what's funny is although the RP maybe doesn't open its mouth quite as bit as uh, quite a, as bit as American English, um, RP is very specific with consonants. Um, so I'll often get multilingual speakers to get a wine cork, have a wine cork, and practice with a wine cork in the mouth. It's quite old school. Um, and, and it's been kind of shunned for a while. It's no, a bit controversial, no, no, yeah. <laughs> no bone props. Um, but it, I find it really useful. Yes, I do. You have to be using it with a, some good technique. You know, you don't want to be biting into the cork. You don't want any extra tension in your neck or your jaw. Clench. Yeah. You, yeah, it's just to kind of, I'm doing it on the, <laughs> with my thumb. It's just, just to kind of rest in between the teeth. And then speak something, speak a text, speak a a news article. And it just engages all of those sounds, those consonants and the vowel sounds in the language. Then take it out and speak normally. You'll be that much more clear, really. Really, really. Yeah, it, it really does help. Yeah, and I, I think I read that probably in your was that your newsletter. I think that it's a bit controversial, but it, that it can be useful. Anyway, I just recently read about that or heard about that somewhere. It um, can so be. It can be know. controversial. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I, I have a, a German actor who um, mumbled. His, no, that's mean to say. He did not mumble his way through his entire career. He mumbled a lot of his way through his entire career, yeah. and then found the cork. And uh, he's a he's a big believer. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! So that, I'm glad he's open to that. You know, um, after a long career, he loves of it he, all the time. He carries it around. <laughs> awesome! Yeah, <laughs> that's great. So maybe one last thing uh, here. I had a, a question from a listener about. Um, I guess it's about sh- being. Um, how do you say short of breath or or um just having having a difficulty to catch their breath um especially while simultaneous interpreting mm. are there any suggestions you have there i suppose it's similar when you're nervous maybe doing a big presentation and you're kind of sort of yeah almost hyperventilating i guess maybe not quite as extreme but uh, is there is there a good counter technique i think well and i remember that this question also i think the the person had mentioned that they on top of it had a a deviated septum. Um, And so it was going to be hard to breathe through their nose anyway. Mm, With that being said, you know, not to say that the mouth breathing is not bad. It's not incorrect. If that person needed to shift from breathing through their nose to to their mouth, I I don't see that as a, as a, a big issue. The key really would be what's, beyond not being able to breathe through your nose or your mouth, is it that in that tense situation, they're holding their breath completely unconsciously? Um, Is it that they're kind of not attaching one breath per thought, you know, maybe accidentally extending that and then finding themselves caught out later and and needing to take a top-up breath in the middle of the thought? So it, it would be something to look into. And then if someone does have a deviated septum, I, I, you know, go and see maybe a, an ear, nose, throat doctor or, or a, a speech language therapist just to get that checked out um, if, if, it's, if it's really affecting the, the, the way that they're, they're performing or the way that they feel like they can do their job. Maybe now's a good time to do that, you know, given that uh, that we have just have less, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, less work, um, uh, less work to do. So that could be a good time to to do that as well. Um, listen, I want to be respectful of your time. I, I have plenty of more questions, but maybe <laughs> we can just do a, a follow up session at that point. Um, but I would certainly recommend um, people check out your website. It's uh, RebeccaGorsnell.com. Yeah, I think it's just my surname.com. Or just the sonar. Yep. Okay, so I'll make sure to, to put in the links. And I really recommend you sign up to the newsletter as well. Uh, that had some some very good tips in it. And um, yeah, maybe we can get some of uh, our interpreters your way for some Zoom uh, lessons <laughs> or something like that. And uh, yeah, I certainly hope that uh, that the current situation will get to an end eventually so we can get to you know, some kind of normalcy, I guess. <laughs> So do you have any plans when, when you're going back to London or you're staying staying put for the moment? Mm, currently playing it day by day. 
I'm very happy in France right now. Europe seems a little bit uh, good calmer place to be than, these days than, yeah. than the UK. <laughs> yeah, is there, and, and there's a quarantine in place now, right? So if you go back, you you have to stay at home for two weeks. Is that still a thing? Apparently, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's still that's still a thing. Of course, the, everything's changing day by day. So who knows what that'll look like next week or the week after? Yeah, exactly. We'll just play it by ear, uh, as you said. Uh, ideally, by a Tomatis uh, tuned ear. <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. So thanks so much, Rebecca, for being so generous with your with your time and your advice. I really appreciate it, and I, I believe so do the the listeners. And um, I guess stay safe, everyone. And um, I hope to talk to you very soon. I'm going to uh, end the session here.